She'd just gotten the oil changed in her car. And when I got home, I looked at the receipt, and I'm like, that doesn't, that doesn't seem right. That seems, seems more than it should have been. And so I looked over the, the itemized portion of the receipt, and I saw a charge for $50. And I'm like, what? What is, what is this? Brooke! Brooke! Brooke, come here! And she comes running in the room thinking something's wrong. She's like, what? what? Are you okay? I'm like, well, no, I'm not okay. What's this charge for $50? above the the cost of the oil change and she's like we needed a new cabin air filter and I'm like oh you just got played you just got played it took me back about 10 years ago when we got our when we got our Civic and I remember the first time I went in to get the oil changed everything went great second time everything was fine about a year into owning the car they, they're changing the oil, which was included from the dealership when we, when we bought the car. But then they said, sir, we're going to we're gonna have to charge you $45 a day for the cabin air filter. And I said, well, where's the cabin air filter? And they're like, sir, you, you don't even, even want to try to attempt this yourself. I mean, you have to take the glove box off. It's up underneath. And I, at this point in my life, I was not the most handy individual uh, not that I am now, but I was even worse then, and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And then a couple times doing this, I'm like, I'm just going to go on to Amazon and see what one of these things costs. Nine dollars. It costs nine dollars. And then I'm like, I, I wonder if there's a way that I could figure out how to take the glove box off of the car, to which my loving wife, Brooklyn, said, don't even attempt it. Just don't even try. I'm like, but I think, I think I could, I think I could manage this. I think it, it would be, she's like, don't don't even attempt it. And so I waited one day until she was going off to work. And then I sent her a text that said, just so you know, before I do this, I'm willing to live with all the consequences. And I know you're going to at first be upset with me, but I really think through the power of YouTube videos, I'm going to be able to take the glove box off the car. So I'm going to go attempt that. And I watched the YouTube video. You know how long it took me to take the glove box off the car and change my cabin air filter? Five minutes. Five minutes. And I was replacing what I had been paying $45 to $50 for, for $9. I knew, I knew all along what I needed to do. I knew all along that I didn't need somebody else to replace that, that I could do this, but I just didn't know how. I knew what I needed to do to cut down on the cost, but I didn't know how to do it. This morning as we wrap up our look at the book of 1 Corinthians and what we've called correction, as we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the final chapter of 1 Corinthians, we're going to see two things that we all know we need right now especially in the height of this pandemic, as people are talking about the stresses that they, that they are facing. And perhaps you've seen the stories this week that anxiety medicine is up anywhere from 35 to 45% based on the studies recently. The two of the main factors that are going in to contribute to this are finances and community. Two of the main stresses that people are experiencing right now deal with their finances and their community. And the good news is that as followers of Jesus, we have a blueprint. We have a plan. So you might be saying right now that you know what you, you know that there needs to be a change. You just don't know how to do it. And I just want to encourage you, follow along. Because we're given a plan that we're going to unpack this morning, and we're going to see that if we live our lives according to God's design, and we follow God's plan with our lives, we can invite peace into those areas of our lives that are bringing so many other people stress and anxiety right now. So if you have your phones or your tablets and you're not watching on them and you want to follow along with us on the Bible app, we'd encourage you to do so. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 16, beginning in the first verse of the chapter, where we read this. Now concerning the collection for the saints, 
as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. So I just want to stop right there and just just give you a little bit of background. As, as you read through the New Testament, you, the, the majority of the New Testament, a lot of the New Testament is letters that are written to churches, are letters that are written to churches. And in that process, sometimes you read things that are descriptive, meaning it was ju- just explaining what was happening at the time. And the purpose of it is just to give you the background, just to help you understand all the issues and significance of what's going on at the time. So it's just that. It's a description. But there are also things throughout the New Testament that are what people call prescriptive. And generally, these are things that, hey, no matter what church you're in, no matter what point in time, this is something that you need to apply. Not everything in the New Testament that's written needs to be applied in every church. After all, the vast majority of churches in the New Testament were house churches. And so they are managed in one way that is different than than other churches would be managed because they're dealing with a lot fewer people. They're dealing with an intimate community. and, And so the structure was different. So there are things that are descriptive, but there are things that are prescriptive. And one of the general rules of thumb is generally something is prescriptive if it's a command and it's repeated in multiple churches. That's a good way to know that it's something that's prescriptive, something that all churches should do, and not just something that was describing what was happening. And so we get to this issue of generosity within the church. And what we see is this was true in a church in Galatia. That would be the church that Galatians was written to. And it's also true here to the church in Corinth that First and Second Corinthians were written to. And so this is something that has ramifications not just in one church, but in all churches. And so this is something that is to be applied and is to be utilized. He continues in verse 2. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Let me read those words again. On the first day of every week, on the first day of every week, so that is when the church gathered. The early church was, were Jewish people. They would traditionally gather on the, on the Sabbath. They, they would They would worship not on Sunday. Sunday was the first day of the week, but everything changed with the resurrection of Jesus. And so the early church met on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because it happened on the first day of the week. That's why we get together on Sunday. It doesn't mean that that's the only time that we can get together, but there's this principle that the church met on Sunday, and there was importance behind it, remembering the resurrection of Jesus. So every Sunday that we get together as a church, we remember the resurrection of Jesus. It is central to what we do. On the first day of every week, Each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. He's saying there needs to be a regular system of giving in place in your personal finances. That this isn't something that you do from what's left over, but instead there's a principle that's throughout the Old Testament Proverbs 3 speaks a lot about this in in verses 9 and 10, especially Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. But it talks about this idea of giving to God what would be known in farming circles as your first fruits. A lot of the Bible was written in in a farming community and in a farming society. And there's this idea that what you give to God should be the first of what you earn that it should be your best. It shouldn't be what's left over, but instead it should be a principle for you and something that you regularly practice, that it's important to you, that there's a regular system. We've seen it, that it's weekly, and this doesn't mean in a society where people are paid either every two weeks or twice monthly or or some of you quarterly, some, some annually, based on what you do. It doesn't mean that This literally means that every week you have to give something. But the principle is that you are disciplined and that you are planning to do so. That it is something that has worked its way into part of your life. That it is a regular system for you to exhibit. That it's planned, it's not left over, and it's not cause-driven. 
It's not just dependent upon the cause. I mean, he says, I don't want to have to, when I show up to you, I don't want to have to do the song and dance. I don't want to have to do the spiel that you get at every Christian concert you go to about how children are going to starve if you don't give. And that's not to say that you shouldn't sponsor children. But what he's saying is, I don't want to have to go through all of that routine. That's, that's not the principle. The principle of it is that this should be systematic so that you further the work of of the church regularly, and every single one of you should take part in this. This is a universal thing that should be part of every follower of Jesus, that they are generous and that they contribute. And so maybe this is a brand new idea to you, and maybe you're like, maybe you're tempted to turn off right now, and you're thinking, oh yeah, the church just wants something from me. That's typical. They want my money. They want something from me. And and nothing could be further from the truth. We want something for you. We want something for you. And so if this is a a brand new idea to you, and you're like, well, I I just, you know, going right into a system, we'd encourage everybody to be at that systematic approach. That This is part of the discipline of your life, but get started with something. Get started with something. And then move, move from something into a system and have that system in place. And then once the system is in place, move from the system to also include sacrifice. But there are times where you can do even more. But generosity will completely change the way that you manage your finances. Now, there are a couple things that are big obstacles to overcoming in in bringing this about in your life. One of them is fear. One of them is fear. I mean, certainly if, if you've recently been furloughed or lost your job, we're not asking you for anything. We're not asking you to give. The, the whole point of this is when you're receiving income, that is, that is when you're to do this. So if you've just lost your job, we're not asking you for anything. But But what we would desire is for you to understand that God has a system in place. And when you follow that system, there's margin and there's freedom in your life. The first thing is fear. And that's why we have said in the past here at Lakeside, and why we will continue to say this to people, that if you are somebody who who understands the need as a follower of Jesus to be generous, but you just can't wrap your mind around it because of the fear, we want to provide you a safety net. And the safety net we provide you at Lakeside is this. If you are somebody who, who, is, who wants to give and you just can't get over this fear because you've never put God to the test in this area, and it's one of the ways that God says, put me to the test in this area, and you will see that I'm faithful, and you will see that I provide. And so we believe that. We believe that wholeheartedly. And one of the ways that we put our money where God's mouth is because we trust in him completely is we tell you this. You go ahead and start, and if at any point for three months, 90 days, at any point in time, we will give you every cent back, no questions asked if you need it. If you are here, and this this idea is something that resonates in your heart, and you know it needs to be something that is a discipline that you practice, but it's not something that you can fully engage in just because of that fear, we're saying get up on the tightrope, but understand we're offering you the safety net. Because we so believe, we so believe that when you follow God's plan for your finances, you are going to experience freedom like you've never experienced before, that we want to help you do that. And so we will provide that safety net to you. Another thing that holds people back is the comparison game. If we're going to be generous people, If we're going to be people who practice generosity, that means there are going to be some areas in our lives we have to sacrifice. Which means when we look at people who have similar style jobs and roles to ours, and we look and we see their house might be a little bit nicer. Their car is going to be a little bit newer. Their phone is going to be the most recent that was released. And in our minds, and it's a subtle thing, but it's, it's in all of our minds, we start to play the comparison game. That's just how we're wired. 
It's just within all of us. We start to play that comparison game, and we think, but if they have that, well, I should have that, or more. And if you follow God's design for finances in generosity and following God's designs that you live below your means, that you save up for a rainy day, that you don't spend in everything you make, let me tell you, let me tell you the truth. You're never going to win that comparison game. And here's why. Because you're not going to be in insurmountable debt. You're not going to be shackled to the bondage of debt that everybody else in our society is shackled to. And it looks like they've got more than you, but in reality, they're just paying the bank more than you. You want freedom in your finances? In this uncertain time, follow God's plan. This isn't a principle for people who are rich. This is a universal principle for people who love Jesus. And I just want to say right now, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because so many of you understand and practice this principle. That in these uncertain times, we are able, we are able to do what we're doing. This year, we as a church, we stepped out in faith and said, we are going to expand the staff team. And oh, by the way, understand this. If you're on the staff at Lakeside, you're practicing this or you're gone. You're practicing this or you're gone. And you sign sign a covenant when you start that says, I will practice this because we're not going to ask anybody else to pay us to work here if we're not practicing this. And so you can... Just take heart and know that the staff team here practices this or they're gone. It's that simple. We are not messing around with this because if we're asking you to do something, we're going to lead. That's required of us. We will lead or we'll move them on somewhere else. It's just that simple. So we as a staff, we practice this. And what we want for everybody is to understand that there is is freedom in your finances when you do them according to God's plan. Thank you for those of you who've been so incredibly generous. Thank you for what you've done to enable us to get this message of hope out to others. And if you're on the sidelines in this area, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that that you're not getting into heaven or anything like that. But what it does mean is God has a greater plan for your life and your finances. And we want to help you get started. So get started and know that the safety net is there because we believe this will change your life. And the reason that we believe that is because God said so, but also because we have personal stories. It's changed mine. And I've heard from others of you how it's changed yours, and we want that for you. He continues, And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Basically what he's saying is put trustworthy people, put trustworthy people around the money. So if if you've been if you've been convicted of fraud, that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love you. He he does. It doesn't mean that you can't be redeemed. You can. But understand, we're not gonna put you in charge of taking the collection here at Lakeside. We're it's just not something we're gonna do. Um, Jesus can change you, and that's awesome, uh, but we're going to give it some time to, to prove that. So he's saying put trustworthy people in important positions. So that's the financial piece. Now we get to the community aspect. And as he's wrapping up his letter to the, to the church in Corinth, he writes these words in verse 5. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. What he's saying is I want a deep connection here. I want to spend time with you. I want to engage with you. I want community. Community is so vitally important. And right now, I know it's incredibly difficult because we have to be distanced But in our distance, let's make sure that we're not distant. 
in our distance, let's make sure that we're not distant. And that is, that is why we are taking, we're taking efforts to stay connected. We want to stay connected with you. Send us an email. Give us a call. Join us on Facebook. Whatever the case may be, we want you to know that while you are distanced, you are not distant. And while we can't be together physically, and we hope very soon, we will be able to do that again. But know that you are not isolated and know that you are not alone. That you do not have to go through life alone. We are here for you. And I know for some people it's just that connection that, that if, if you could just get out and hug. Some of you are huggers and you just love to hug people. And I'm not generally a hugger, so I... I you know, whatever. I'm, I, I'm not really sad that I haven't been able to hug a lot, but some of you right now, you are just dying inside because you're huggers and you just wish that you could hug people right now. And I understand that, that that's a really hard challenge, but just try the best of your ability, mind over matter, understand those days will come again and you can have the longest, most awkward hug of your life and just please let it be with somebody who's also a hugger because if they're not a hugger, then it's just going to be really weird for them and they're going to feel trapped and they're going to start hyperventilating and and just feel like the world's closing in on them and you're just going to be squeezing them and just like, just enjoy this wonderful moment. They're going to be like, just get away from me, you freak. So just find somebody who's also another hugger when you have that super long, awkward embrace, and those of us who aren't will just kind of wave and laugh at you. Uh, But you know, you do you. That's fine. But know that day will come again. But find ways, find ways to be united. Find ways, whether that's social media, whether that's picking up the phone and, and calling some people, whether that's going old school and writing somebody a letter. Maybe it's email. Whatever the, whatever the case may be for you, find ways to stay engaged. That while we have to be distanced, we don't have to be distant. So make it a priority to make sure that there are people that you are calling and checking up on. And, and hopefully you'll have people who are calling and checking up on you as well. But this is something that is, is especially important right now. The community matters. And people matter. He continues, But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. He says, I really want to be with you, but I can't just yet. I have to do some work here in in Ephesus. Notice what he says at the end. Effective work. There's a wide door for effective work and... There are many adversaries. I just want to remind you, if you do meaningful things, you're going to face opposition. If you do meaningful things, you're going to face opposition. Never let the opposition be what stops you. Because they're going to be there. He continues, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. When Timothy comes, see to it that you put him at ease, for he's doing the work of the Lord. Let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace. Listen, make the choice. Make the choice to be a cheerleader rather than a critic. Make the choice to be a cheerleader rather than a critic. That is one of the things that I love so much about this church. I love so much about Lakeside is the vast majority of people at Lakeside have made the choice to be cheerleaders and not critics. And I can't say that I've always worked in churches like that. In fact, some of you maybe have experienced churches like that, where you are just quick. You're just quick to be the critic. You're quick to point out everybody else's flaws. You're quick to see the problem in everybody else. And I've just reached the point in my life where never again in my life do I want to be surrounded by people like that who instead of encouraging people and loving them and pushing them on, instead wants to find just the the wrong in everything. Now, that doesn't mean that as a cheerleader, you don't, in part of the loving process, you don't help people grow. 
That, that is loving. And in fact, one of, the, one of the things about love is that love requires you sometimes to say the most difficult thing to people. The difference between a cheerleader and a critic is the cheerleader picks the time to do that, and they do it in private. The critic proclaims it publicly. That's the difference. And so just because you're a cheerleader for somebody doesn't mean that you just give everything that they do a stamp of approval because all of us have some really dumb ideas. All of us have some really dumb ideas. And that doesn't mean that you just go along with it all the time. But what it does mean is you pick your spots, that you say it in love, and that you criticize the idea and not the person. That's the difference. So as a church collectively, let's make sure that we are cheerleaders of people and not critics of people. And the best way to do that is making sure as individuals that we are cheerleaders of people and not critics of people. That if we're going to say something publicly, we say something publicly that builds somebody up, that affirms them. And we are not quick on our feet to be the people who publicly shout down everything else, and point out how everybody else is wrong. He goes on, now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has an opportunity. So Paul's saying, I wanted Apollos to come to you right now, but he didn't want to, but he didn't want to. Part of community is understanding you can't make decisions for others. That's part of community. It's understanding that you can't make decisions for others. You have to allow people to make their own choices. You have to allow people to make their own choices. You can't make decisions for others. This is every parent's tension from about 17 to 25. That There's a lot of wisdom, but your kids think you're idiots. I've said frequently, it's amazing how much smarter my dad got after I got out of college. Because up to that point in time, through high school and college, the man was a complete idiot. He didn't know anything. And then it's amazing how much smarter he got once I got out of college. I mean, it's just like an instant, just an instant boom in his brain. All of a sudden, he had knowledge. Of course not. He knew it all along. But the difference is... You get to a point where you raise your kids to the best of your ability, and then they have to make their own choices. And for parents, that is an incredibly difficult process where you watch your kids make some mistakes. And every tension that every parent faces is how much do we allow them to fail? What do we allow them to do? And the overbearing parent which ultimately pushes kids away even more, is the parent who never accepts the fact that they have to let their kid make their own choices. And they want to manage every aspect of their child's life into adulthood. And there lies a great amount of tension in family dynamics when parents are unwilling to let go. And so it is in community. So it is amongst people we love. So it is amongst friends that we can speak wisdom into their lives, that we can encourage them to do certain things. But at the end of the day, they ultimately have to make the choices for themselves. We can't micromanage them, and we can't make their choices for them. And so Paul's saying, I wanted Apollos to come to you right now, but he made his own choice, and it's different than mine. And rather than, rather than just bury the guy, rather than speak badly about him, he says, and I'm confident he'll come to you when he can. It's not what I would have chosen, but he's an adult. He's a grown man. He loves Jesus. He loves you. He'll be there when he can. He wasn't like, oh, can you believe that, Apollos? Well, I wanted him to come to you right away. Because I love you guys so much. He should be there right now. But he just didn't want to come to you. That's not what he does. He says, hey, I thought he should come now. He said he can't. But he'll get, he'll get to you when he can. Let's make sure we're people who, when, when people disagree with our approach, that we're charitable. And that we still see the best in them. Even though they disagreed with what we thought they should do. 
Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. He says, don't be soft or weak. Don't be soft or weak. But in that process, don't lose sight of love. Don't be soft, don't be weak, but in that process, don't allow your heart to become hardened to the point that you lose sight of love. And then verse 15, he says, Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. Find the people that fill you and let them know what they do for you, even if they have really weird names. Find the people that fill you, that recharge you, that make you laugh, that make you smile, that make you feel good, that make you feel encouraged. Find those cheerleaders. Spend time with them. Spend time around people who love you and want the best for you. Find the people that fill you and spend the majority of your time with them. Make sure that the friends that you choose are people who make you feel good who encourage you and make you long for more time together, not make you wish that you'd never reply to that invitation. So finances and lack of community are stresses that all Americans are currently facing. So let's make sure that we do it according to God's design, that as a community, we're distanced, but not distant. There were cheerleaders collectively, but also individually, and not critics. That we allow others to be different than us, and rather than judge them accordingly, we still love them and celebrate who they are. And we're intentional to spend time with people who fill us, rather than drain us. Let's make sure that these are the steps we take. Oh, we're distanced, but not to be distant. And in terms of our finances, have a system. Live according to a system. Make sure you tell your money where to go and what to do so you can be generous. And that you are giving from the front end rather from what's left over. And if we do this and we operate in community and we operate our finances according to God's design, we've just reduced two of the biggest stressors that Americans are facing right now in the midst of this pandemic. God has a better way. The question is, will we follow it? God, I pray we would be people who would be invested and engaged in one another's lives. That we would be, while we, are, while we are distanced from one another right now, we would not be distant. That we would have a community of people that we know are in our corner. And that we would be in the corners of others. That we would love that we would encourage, that we would celebrate. That we would be people who follow your plan in every area of our lives. I pray for the person right now who knows they need to be generous, but who is just paralyzed by fear. And I pray, God, they would take that step of faith and trust you. I pray for the person, God, right now who's thinking it's hopeless. They're just laid off. 
and furloughed with no hope of a quick return. And I pray, God, that you would sustain them in all their need. And their dependence would grow on you during this time. And I thank you for the generosity of so many people in this church that we can come alongside so many. When the chips are down and it seems like hope is gone, and come alongside them and say, your need is taken care of. Because God loves you. And knowing that's possible, because your people have been generous. Let it start with each of us. Let us be generous. And let us be connected. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.